hello again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Guy Stevens. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Really happy to have you joining us today. We've got another amazing uh, presentation on tap. I do want to kind of mention who we are. The Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint uh, is an organization that was formed really to raise awareness about the use of restraint and seclusion in schools and really beyond anywhere that those methods are being used. Our mission is to really educate people and bring connect people together who are dedicated to changing minds, laws, policies, and practices so that things like restraint and seclusion are reduced and eliminated in schools across the nation and beyond. Our vision is to see safer schools for students, teachers, and staff. So today we are very excited to have two special guests joining us. Uh, we've got Rachel and uh, Kelly joining us today to talk about uh, integrating CPS and the PBIS framework. And we're going to be taking questions during the presentation today. Uh, so if you have a question uh, while they're presenting, feel free to add that to the chat. Uh, if you have a question afterwards, we'll be taking questions afterwards as well. Do want to remind you that as always, we are recording today's session. So it will be recorded and made available on Facebook, YouTube, and as an audio podcast. So thank you again for joining us today. And let me now introduce to you our co-host for the day. Uh, we have Beth Tolly uh, here co-hosting today. And Beth is the Director of Educational Strategy for the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, Beth retired in 2018, but since retiring has gotten put to lots of work trying to help people. Uh, so she retired from a leadership position in Virginia's lead agency for early intervention for infants and toddlers. And her experience as a parent and grandparent of children whose behaviors have challenged the adults in their lives has fueled her passion to improve lives of children, their families, uh, through education, mutual support, and advocacy. So Beth, welcome as always. Thank you. So I know that you are, and you and I are both very excited about our uh, presentation today. And with that, I'll kick it off to you to make an introduction. Okie doke. Well, yes, I am thrilled. This is one of the ways that I keep learning um, is through meeting people like Kelly and Rachel. Um, Kelly, Sarah, and Rachel, Oh, I, I didn't ask you how to say it. Polacek? Polacek. Polacek. <laughs> I should have done that first. <laughs> no worries. Uh, there are two educators in Wisconsin. Um, Kelly is a counselor for seven years, and Rachel is a school psychologist uh, with 19 years of experience. Both of them work in elementary schools, and they, they came together to work on this idea that they have made real of incorporating the CPS, which is the collaborative and proactive solutions approach um, into schools that are using a PBIS or positive behavior interventions and support framework. And so they've had many years of experience with this and they're going to share with all of us um, how this has worked and what they did to, to make it work. and. Um, I do want to say that the today's session is not going to be about the CPS system itself, uh, CPS approach. Um, there's lots of resources we can direct you to if you want more. They'll do a high level overview, but mainly they're going to talk about the implementation of um, working that into a school that um, was using a behaviorism uh, PBIS approach. So I welcome you both, Guy and I welcome you both. We're thrilled you're here. Well, thank you so much. And as our Bitmojis um, can show you, we are excited to be here and share our experience and knowledge with you all today. That's great. Hey, Kelly and Rachel, I'm going to bring your presentation up here on the screen in just a yeah. second. Um, and, and as I do, uh, I just wanted to, say, you know, again, um, you know, reiterate what Beth said. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, as you're probably well aware, we are big fans of uh, Dr. Ross Green and the collaborative and proactive solutions model. Uh, big believers in the idea that kids do well if they can. Um, so knowing where you're going to focus, I will put in a link in our chat to Lives in the Balance for people that might want to learn more about the collaborative proactive solutions approach. But really excited to have you here and, and talking about what you've done to to bring this model into the PBS framework, uh, because this is a challenge. You know, we, we know there's better practices out there like collaborative proactive solutions, but changing culture and changing systems that are in use is really tough. So thank you again for joining us and I will let you take it away. And Beth and I will be Except quiet until we have questions. Except I have to say one thing, sorry. I always do this. Uh, Ross Green's The Explosive Child is what started me on 
understanding there was a different, better way. I knew the way things were being done wasn't good, but it was that book that got me rolling on all of this. So that's it. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. Um, Thank you. Yes, we're very grateful uh, for Dr. Green and Lives in the Balance and um, our continued work for them has just been pivotal for our careers and um, has have helped us help many educators and kids as well. So um, continue gratitude for, for them. And our, we're on, right? Good? Yep. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of a background. Um, you had mentioned um, I've been a school psychologist for 19 years. Um, I've been implementing CPS in my building since about 2015. Um, I'm currently in a elementary building in North Fond du Lac, so just outside of Fond du Lac. Um, we have about 600 students. Um, I worked with Kelly Sarah for five of my years in my previous district right next door um, where my kids attend for seven. Um, I've been there for 17 years, worked with Kelly for five of those years. Um, and just a personal mission and why. Um, we just want to bring CPS to as many districts as we can and, and, and try to overcome and share our work, overcoming some of the barriers that might exist to, to really growing CPS and making it part of a school's culture. Um, we want it to show up in a big way in our nation's schools. We really feel that um, empathic discipline um, in our schools, we need that more, now more than ever. Um, so that it's definitely just our mission statement to really just figure out how to get this in, in, many, in, in as many schools as we can and share our knowledge and our experience um, to help that um, grow faster. And I'm Kelly Sarah. I was, up until just a few days ago, a school counselor at an elementary school in Fond du Lac, and now I am the proud and excited assistant principal at Woodworth Middle School in Fond du Lac. So I am beginning a new journey um, and plan to bring my knowledge and experience with me to my new school. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so we have, if we have any Fondy listeners, like go Fondy, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, and North Fondy. Um, <laughs> So Rachel and I, like she said, we've been implementing since about 2015, and we have just seen the students and cultures and climates of our schools literally just transform. So we are really excited to share our story with you today. Um, my personal mission and why is that I just want to cre help, help create a culture and climate in our schools where CPS can live, thrive, and positively impact the entire um, educa educational experience for our children and for our teachers and staff because when we understand what is getting in a student's way um, just great great things happening happen and um, really great connections are made so this picture here um, was taken last April so in April of 2020 we started to get connected with Dr. Ross Green which we still I don't know, freak out about that every <laughs> once in a while. Like, we know him. Um, so we've had the opportunity to write a paper with him and collaborate more with him and have some exciting opportunities coming that um, you can stay tuned for. So welcome, and we're really glad you're here. And I love that picture of Dr. Green that you had, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to take a screen capture of that one. Yeah. I was <laughs> he, he looked as excited to be uh, with you guys as you looked to be with him, which was great. I, think, I mean, he should be. I <laughs> think he was like, he wanted a picture with me. And we were just like, as you can see, I was like right in the <laughs> Yeah. Great. He's an amazing person to say the least. <laughs> Um, we're just going to give you guys just a, a brief overview of CPS. We know many of you who are here today are familiar with the CPS model, um, Dr. Ross Green's model, collab Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. Um, collaborative and Proactive Solutions is a more compassionate, productive, effective approach to understanding and helping our most challenging kids. Um, the CPS model has been implemented in countless families, schools, inpatient psychiatric units, therapy therapeutic group homes and residential and juvenile detention facilities across the world. Um, the approach sets forth two major tenets. Um, number one is that challenging behavior in kids is best understood that it is the result of lagging cognitive skills of the child and that the best way to reduce challenging episodes is by working together with the child or collaborating to solve problems that 
we're setting them in motion in the first place um, versus um, a reward and punishment model. Um, as educators, we're always continually working with students daily. We're providing care and support that will help them in many ways. Um, before we had CPS though, um, we were missing the mark. Um, I felt as a psychologist, Kelly felt as a counselor that we were constantly spinning our wheels. We were in a lot of meetings where we were admiring problems, where everyone left frustrated or we'd have a long intervention plan and we weren't seeing results. Um, so we knew that we needed something more and I was lucky to, um, I was actually a part of a trauma-informed um, training through our Department of Public Instruction. And there was um, a link to an article that Dr. Green had written. It was my first exposure to CPS um, and it just completely hit me um, and made me think about, okay, how can this fit in what we're doing now? And how do I change lenses of a huge school system on how we can um, do better by our kids and our teachers. Um, so that was kind of a huge turning point for us. There are four key beliefs um, in the CPS model. So we'll just touch on them here. So first being the model is based on the premise that concerning behavior occurs when the expectations being placed on a kid exceed the kid's capacity to respond adaptively. Um, so I think this has been really the biggest shift in that um, we are viewing behavior as communication, that they are having difficulty meeting an expectation. Um, key belief number two is that the emphasis on the model isn't on the concerning behavior. Um, it is on, again, it's just telling us they're having difficulty meeting expectations. So in schools, um, and actually in our own homes too. We're no longer focused on the whining, the pouting, the crying, the screaming, the swearing. Um, we are focused on the expectation that came when this um, challenging behavior occurred. Um, the third belief is that the focus is on identifying the skills that the student is lacking and the expectations that they're having difficulty meeting. And that is really um, the job as educators and the adults is to um, determine the skills and expectations that students are having difficulty meeting. And finally, the end goal is to help kids and caregivers solve these problems rather than try to modify the kids' behavior through rewards, punishments, or other interventions. Um, just to give you an idea what this might look like in a school setting, um, if a student is out of their seat in math, um, say in the math mini lesson, and not complying with um, teacher directions, um, before CPS, um, we might try ignoring, redirecting, talking warmly, talking firmly. Um, if the student's um, challenging behavior continues, maybe other students were removed from the class, maybe the student was removed, and you can see how that turned into a really big cycle um, really quickly. Now our goal is to regulate the child, relate with them, and then reason, which if you are um, familiar with Dr. Bruce Perry's work, that's um, some of his language, which we have um, really adapted into some of our work. And so our goal is to do regulate, relate, and reason. And our reasoning looks like um, plan B with students. So we have really been able to get students back in the game of learning, as we like to say, much quicker because they know that their voice at the table um, is what they can expect every single time um, a challenging moment happens. Um, a lot of times um, in PBIS structures or school districts um, or states, we talk about the triangle. Um, where does CPS um, fit into the triangle and where is it used as an intervention? So many of you are familiar with, with, uh, with this triangle. It's talked about a lot in RTI. Um, we feel that CPS fits in all three tiers. Um, CPS um, has really become just part of our whole school culture. Um, our lenses um, have changed that we are helpers in solving our problems with kids. Um, we have solid and clear boundaries around our work. Um, this is just what help looks like. So we don't um, label kids anymore as um, that used to happen in our buildings, that's a tier two kid or that's a tier three kid um, because we feel that kids don't show up 
that way to school every day. Um, you don't have kids always acting out 24 seven, just as adults, we may have a bad morning um, at home, may run into some issues on our way to work, where we may be more of a tier two, tier three adult, but it doesn't stay that way. Um, and we felt like there was some stigma with kids sometimes when we would label kids in those um, tiers. So we really feel like whether or not a student has one unsolved problem or multiple unsolved problems that you can fit CPS. Um, we have seen CPS fit into this is just the classroom climate and culture. Uh, this is just what we do. Uh, I have teachers introduce our problem solving sheets and plan B to their classrooms day one, that this is just how we solve problems in our class. Classroom, um, and that's a universal tier one um, intervention. If if we're having, a, if I notice you're having an unsolved problem, I'm going to sit down with you, and this is what it's going to look like. You're not in trouble. But if I'm asking you what's getting in your way, it's because as a class, this is how we solve problems together. Um, so we really address the challenging behavior at all tiers um, with our CPS approach. So it's become more. It's become much more than. Uh, an intervention, it really is just the way um, we we uh, address all of our problems with kids. So we wanted to touch a little bit on our why. So we um, have really reflected as to why we needed CPS truly in our system as a school and not just in our hearts as a school counselor and school psychologist. So um, this really speaks to the amount of time that we have done um, professional development with our staff and how their, their views and lenses um, related to challenging behaviors has really shifted too. So um, the quote here is from James Clear who wrote At Atomic Habits. It says, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Your goal is your desired outcome. Your system is the collection of daily habits that will let you get there this year. Spend time, spend less time focusing on outcomes and more time focusing on the habits that precede the results. So this really, um, when I read this book I and I read this quote, I was like, this is it. Because um, if you want to bring CPS to your school and to your system, it can't just be in your role, it really has to be throughout. Because if I have students that I'm meeting with and I am problem solving with them, but then they go to a different classroom or they go to the playground and that's not the same language that they're used to, that's where that disconnect happens. So um, we also have had a lot of really great conversations with um, our staff and have started to tweak our system and change our system so that our students overall are meeting more of our expectations. So problem solving um, and plan B conversations have been, there's still many happening. I don't want to say this is not, but there's less because we have addressed appropriate expectations throughout our school at that system level. This is also my slide. <laughs> Um, we have for two months. Number one is the universal support that all students receive um, when they come to their school. So all students access tier one support. And again, we're trying to really move away from that language and that that tiered language really puts a um, students into categories. And again, we're trying very hard not to do that. Um, so in our CPS and PBIS blended schools, we still have positive expectations that are taught and retaught and defined. Um, so at our at um, my school, I have respectful, responsible, and safe are our PBIS expectations. Um, we still have classroom expectations and routines that are very consistent with our school-wide expectations. Um, so it would be appropriate for um, school um, for classroom teachers to say, okay, this is how you ask for help in my classroom. The expectation is you're raising a hand. That falls under the being responsible and respectful category of our PBIS matrix. So we're still having those conversations with our students. Um, we still encourage expected behavior. And now we really view it as met expectations. So in the CPS model, um, it's, we're thinking of unsolved problems, and if students do not have any unsolved problems, we're viewing them as met expectations. 
We still are encouraging school and family partnerships, and we really feel that um, CPS has fostered more positive relationships with families in that when I am calling a parent to share um, information regarding their student, I am still being truthful and saying what happened, of course, but I'm also saying um, this, the expectations that their student had a difficult time meeting and following that up with um, how we're addressing those concerns. So we might still have a safety plan or, you know, we're still using some of those other practices, but they're all done with the students' lagging skills and unsolved problems at the forefront of our work. Um, and then finally, if a student has difficulty meeting expectations, we do plan B instead of numerous reteaching lessons about expectations. So if there are students that are having um, difficulty walking in a line quietly, we are problem solving with them. But first, we're also really examining, is that expectation appropriate? Do we need to define quietly? Do we need, do they need to be quiet? What parts of um, our expectation as adults can we first examine so then students are then able to meet our expectations? Um, one of the biggest, um, I would say, tier one system change that we made, um, Kelly and I were able to be part of a, um, when I was in my previous district, um, where Kelly resides currently, we were able to be on a um, committee that was looking at revising our behavior referral forms. Um, we live in a, in a state of accountability, a system of accountability in education. Um, it's, it's just how things are. Um, it's hard to kind of fight that. So how could we, we wanted to make the forms or the data that were collected work for us and to help us with um, not only our lens change um, with our system and our staff, but also with collecting better data on kids. Um, and we wanted that data to really align with what our philosophy was around challenging behavior. Um, so we were able to um, look at those forms and really um, change those. And when I moved to my current district, um, we were able to adopt that as well. Um, so we are no longer, um, collecting data on more fever behavior or the downstream behavior as Ross, um, as Dr. Green would talk about, but we're collecting data on unsolved problems. So what are the unsolved problems that we're seeing? Now they're not as specific as you need to drill or do plan B with, but it gives us a general idea of what the expectations are that the student is struggling with. Um, this is just an example off of part of one of the forms. Um, uh, you know, we have the activity, it gives us a general idea Idea of where students struggling. Um, so, um, like I said, our forms just look very different. You won't see a lot of um, the past behaviors that we had on there. Um, we're more focused on what was happening before that. One thing that I wanted to add, we included the um, quote by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And I think that's where, um, when we had the opportunity to be on the district level team to re- shape our um, data forms, we were just very grateful and we knew that this was mm -hmm. our opportunity to really slowly help um, shift lenses within our entire district. And we always say that CPS is one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Meaning once you see behavior as just the signal and once you that a student is having difficulty meeting an expectation. And once you're looking for the expectation that they're having difficulty meeting, that's the only thing you see anymore. So the student's not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. And this really, um, by changing our referral forms, really helped um, bring that one step further. Um, this is just some other things that we had changed with that um, form. We eliminated motivation. Um, we believe kids do well if they can, and that behavior is just simply a signal of an unsolved problem. Nothing more, nothing less. So um, motivation isn't part of our, um, we don't believe kids are motivated to do bad or they're not motivated to do good. Um, it's a result of their unsolved problems. So we eliminated that category. Um, we also eliminated the three Ds, defiance, disrespect, disruption. Um, this actually came about, we had um, Dr. Sharaki Holly come visit our district and he talked about 
um, equity and how those three terms were um, found to be um, not equitable um, with our kids. So we got rid of those three categories. Um, the positive outcomes that have come from just changing the form um, is that um, I had mentioned before, our data is aligned with our philosophy about kids. Um, so we have to collect data. It's just the way things are. Um, so it, but we have data that aligns with our lenses and our philosophy about the kids that we have in front of us. It's become useful um, because it will indicate a specific unsolved problem. So um, if I see a form or a slip comes in my, my mailbox and I can see that Johnny's having difficulty during math, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna to have to help facilitate a conversation between Johnny and his teacher about what's getting in the way in math. Um, so it gives me a place to um, help that conversation and that plan be um, happen with that teacher faster. Um, and if it's something that needs to be happening immediately, the first thing I'm going to do is go to that teacher and ask what is math looking like right now, or I'm going to go in as a psychologist and not it, and my observations have changed. Our observations have changed as counselors and psychologists. Uh, we used to go in and we would write down every downstream behavior we observed. Now I simply go in, I might jot them on the side what it looks like when they're having difficulty with the unsolved problems, but most of my observations are looking and identifying unsolved problems um, that might be harder for a teacher that might not be familiar with CPS to identify. Um, our data can help identify trends of unsolved problems for students in classrooms. For example, um, to our last year, I had um, multiple um, forms coming out for difficulty during math in a classroom. Um, so that led to more of a group plan B with that, with that um, classroom about, I knew something was going on in math, so we had to figure that out. So rather than do all those conversations with the kids, um, the teacher trusted me to facilitate a, a conversation with her in her classroom about what was hard about math and what was getting in the way for math. Um, it was a very um, courageous thing that the teacher did and she got feedback and she was able to provide feedback to the kids too. So there was, um, you know, when we talk about regulate, relate, and then reasoning, um, you know, CPS really hits the relationships and the connections, and then, then you're able to do the reasoning and you're able to receive and give feedback to each other to try to figure out um, how we can um, do better. Um, it also keeps our educators focused on problem solving versus admiring the problem and hypothesizing. Um, so when we're looking for unsolved problems, we're taking some of that emotion around that this child is giving you the hard time. Um, we still sometimes struggle with this. It is not easy to be an educator, um, you know, with a whole classroom of, uh, some of our classrooms have up to 29, 30 kids, um, but um, it has kind of helped us, you know, we, you know, look at that lens a little bit different and, and help kind of regulate ourselves as well as the kids um, when we look at that. And, and we're trying to really invoke curiosity with our um, educators. How do we stay, we talk a lot, her and I talk a lot with our staffs about staying curious, um, which helps us get out of that, that um, more negative mindset that um, leads to dysregulation of ourselves. And if we look at ourselves as the adults as co-regulating with our kids, um, it, it gets in the way of us being able to do that effectively. All right, so we're going to move on to a tier two system change that has been um, very helpful in moving our schools forward with CPS and PDIS. Um, so before we came to the light of CPS, um, we had student support meetings that felt, for lack of a better word, terrible. And as the school counselor, I felt like I needed to be the expert in these meetings. I was often the one running the meetings and it was full, reflecting on it now, the meetings were full of um, adult, adults at the table hypothesizing and we were continually missing the mark. So um, now our meetings, we still have meetings um, regarding students. And now our meetings are fully based on the ELSA. So this is an assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. And this um, 
the LSUP is a huge part of the CPS model. So if you aren't familiar, um, like Guy said, he was going to link the Lives in the Balance website. Make sure that this is one thing that you spend um, time getting familiar with as it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, so now our student support meetings are an LSUP meeting, which feels much better to everybody at the table. Um, the great news is, is that as educators, we were already spending the time meeting um, regarding students, but now it's spent feeling not only much better, but it's very productive. So when our LSUP guides our student concerns meeting, um, we are eliminating the where should we start process. Um, we know that we are starting with the very first lagging skill, which is um, difficulty transitioning. And so we go through the LSUP together as a team. Um, as the school counselor, I was leading the meetings and then it would always be um, the classroom teacher. And then if other, um, say, specialists or other um, educators were working with the student, they would be invited to attend the meeting as well. Um, so our meetings are very structured. We're getting much better information. Um, our meetings are scheduled faster because we don't need as many people at the table. Um, it's really just the one teacher that is having um, difficulty um, with the student. We are no longer hypothesizing. And that feels so much better because our meetings go faster and they're very effective. Um, as educators, and I think humans in general, we're always looking for more time. And um, this, having the LSUP guide our student support meeting has been a total game changer. So at the end of our LSUP meeting, we are leaving with three unsolved problems that our team has agreed upon that we are going to um, work on with the students um, or student um, together. And it has just been really a positive change in the way that we used to, from the way that we used to run these meetings. Um, to give you an example, we would um, start our old meetings with student strengths, which felt great. And then we would move on to, I don't know really what, just things like just babbling conversations, I feel like, about students' behavior, which didn't feel good to anybody. And um, like I said, I felt like I had to be the expert and I would recommend, oh, maybe this student could use a first then or a really great intervention or strategy. But I was still missing the mark because we were missing those clear unsolved problems with student voice um, at the table with us. Um, tier two system change, how our tier two uh, team operates within CPS and PBIS structures. Um, we. For team transformations, our team name changed to represent our work and values. Um, for example, my team is consists, we call ourselves an SEL team. Um, our team consists of myself, um, a teacher who has, a, she has some flex time devoted to um, problem solving and doing this work with kids. She has about two hours a week, an assistant principal and a counselor. Um, we all as a team have collectively changed our lenses. Our philosophy and mission of our team are aligned with that and is public um, to the staff um, and rolled out to staff so they are clear in what our roles are. Um, we operate under a clear is kind mindset. We've incorporated a lot of Brene Brown's work um, with through Dare to Lead um, and um, her work um, uh, with working with schools um, into our own system. Um, so you'll hear us quote that a lot. Um, but you know, definitely that clear is kind mindset. We want to be upfront with our staff around what our values are and also clear with our boundaries of what our help will look like like when we're um, intervening and helping with um, kids. Um, we have weekly meetings. We check in and provide update regarding stu students that we're overseeing. We review data collected from Plan Bs and other supports in place. Um, and we have something called a Tier 2 Request for Assistance form. Um, and that helps with um, teachers um, indicating that they need help. Um, we actually do, um, from time to time, presentations that are much more in-depth um, through Lives in the Balance that kind of go into this. But um, this is just a Google form that um, teachers can use. Um, when they need help um, with a student at any time. All right, so we wanted to touch how um, touch on how CPS has changed our PBIS interventions. So um, we are 
still meeting with students all the time. Um, we are no longer prescribing interventions to students. They are with us at the table. So the biggest thing I can say here is that if students do not agree to a um, specific intervention that we might use, that even we might think is would be really helpful to them and we've explained it clearly to them, their voice is valid. So if they don't agree that it is going to be helpful, um, it's not an, an intervention that is considered. So um, the second point here is that we monitor the agreed upon solutions, not the unmet expectations. So we are focusing on um, if a student is having difficulty sitting at the carpet for read aloud, um, and we have agreed upon a solution that um, with the teacher and the student, the we are monitoring the solution that they came up with. We're not worried about if they're sitting at the carpet during that time. We're worried about are they using the solution that was agreed upon. Um, we know and understand student and adult concerns regarding specific unsolved problems. So it has been um, life changing to figure out and to really hear students say what it is um, what is getting in their way related to specific unsolved problems. And more often than not, um, Rachel and I still are surprised by what students say is getting in their way. And without this framework and without um, the CPS model, we would never have, um, we would have missed the bark, missed the mark um, or missed the boat. That's why we have um, my little bitmoji of the boat there. Um, we are feeling that we are really proactive with our interventions and we are so much farther upstream. And this even goes to um, when students have a difficulty coming to school on time as related to attendance. I think this is another area that I've really seen. Um, I've learned so much more about students and what's getting in their way and what it looks like to us as educators and what actually is happening and what's actually getting in their way. Um, more often than not is actually quite heartbreaking and there are so many things that we can do to get them to have less difficulty getting to school on time. Um, number five, students are meeting their goals, which I think has been the greatest, um, another great success. Um, we no longer have students walking around with clipboards, earning smileys um, or points, and when they don't meet their goals, crying at the end of the day. We don't have that at all because, um, like I said earlier, we're focused on those agreed upon solutions. And um, kind of going along with that, we don't have, um, students aren't needing rewards anymore or asking for rewards. Um, the reward truly um, has become intrinsic. We do still have um, PBIS raffles or celebrations, but it's not related to specific behavior. Um, so that's been a really big change that feels really good. Um, so here's an example. Um, in a PBIS only school, the expectation might be that a student is to raise um, their hand before talking. And if they have difficulty doing that, um, there would be things done to the student with good intent, um, reteaching, talking about it. Um, and maybe giving um, your comic or your system, your token system, maybe you have tickets to other students who have met the expectations, things like that. Um, in our schools, we are, um, like we wrote here, bring on plan B. So we are having a plan B conversation with this student um, and it would be related specifically to um, difficulty. It would sound like this. Um, Rachel, I noticed you had difficulty raising your hand to share an answer during social studies. Can you tell me more about that? Or um, if you're familiar with the model, what's up? And again, that conversation comes from the LSUP um, and that Plan B conversation. Um, how CPS has completely changed our school culture. Um, we tried to focus on systems today um, and how we have uh, worked that into existing PBIS systems or structures in our buildings. Um, we have better relationships with our students and with the parents. Um, I can't tell you how many um, 
relationships that have been repaired and connected, and we have reconnected with parents as a result of this work. Um, yes, we still have to call parents to make them aware when their child is having difficulty. However, we're always sharing not only the teacher voice, but the student voice in that conversation. So the, te so the parents know that their students are being heard and that their concerns do matter and that their voice matters just as much as the other adults um, that are having that difficulty. And to know that they're working collaboratively together um, is just everything. Because as parents, I'm I'm a parent. Kelly's a parent. We want if this would if our kids are having unsolved problems in school, we want to know that they had a voice and a chance to work on solving that problem um, with that adult um, as well. Because that's where that accountability lies um, is solving that problem with that with that adult. Um, our students regulate faster. Um, we know when they know that they're able to share their concerns, um, we see um, the outbursts um, and those signs of dysregulation um, reduce because they know that this is part of uh, how we do business, that they're going to have a voice um, eventually in, in solving their own problem. Um, we are now more curious instead of frustrated as a team, as adults in the building. Um, uh, this has been everything. This year was a very trying year. Um, just both of us were, we were on a hybrid model this year. Um, and we just knew uh, with our mental health backgrounds what was coming. Um, so when we came back full time in March, um, we had a lot of dysregulated adults and a lot of dysregulated kids. Um, but um, it was busy and it was stressful, but it was it felt different because we kept our Curious Lens and SEL team and um, really stayed out of it really is self-care when you're doing this work. When you have more of a curious lens, you're not taking it personally. You're not taking the student's behavior or maybe the adult's dysregulation or frustration that things aren't being solved fast fast enough um, as personal, but you're remaining curious and, and trying to figure out, okay, what really is getting in the way? Um, and school-wide, um, we have a school-wide adult sense of we got this. So while we might be seeing some behaviors, we know it is going to get better if we sit down and do that work with working with the student. Um, and we know and we've seen the effects, too, that when we model this, um, we are you can't teach empathy in a social skills lesson. You need to model it with your children. Um, and I think for years you had said that we've done a lot of things to kids with good intentions. Um, and that was our whole career. That's why we all um, got into the career of education and, and being educators is we wanted to change kids um, and have an impact, a positive impact on kids. But a lot of times we miss the mark because we didn't have their voice at the table. And when we, when I first started working with kids, um, Kelly had talked about it too, um, I would say I was wrong about what my hypothesis about what was getting in the kids' way about 80% of the time. Um, so 80% of the time I sat across from a student and asked them what was difficult about whatever the concern was, and 80% of the time I thought, holy cow, I never would have guessed that that got in, that way, in their way. I don't think that anymore because I just don't, I don't have any preconceived notions when I sit down with a student. I might have an idea of maybe what I think, but I don't um, perseverate on that or or um, get hung up on that. I wait till um, I have the student in front of me to figure out what's going on. Um, so, you know, we really it really has changed our culture. Our data has reflected that um, the our rates of detentions and suspensions have uh, reduced dramatically along with seclusion and restraints in our buildings. Um, we're integrating this into this work is integrated into our special ed students as well. Um, so you won't just see a lot of times we would stop working with a student if they went into special education because they had case managers and there was a huge line of students that needed help as well. Now we're working with them and we're continuing this work with our special ed kids just as we are with our regular ed kids. So every kid is getting the opportunity to solve problems with adults in our building. I think the other thing that just to mention here too is that um, we have done our own professional development like when Rachel said that we've really taken on um, Brene Brown's framework, um, Dare to Lead. Leading this work is hard um, and reminding yourself of why it is 
hard, but also why it's worth it. Um, because I can't go back to doing things to kids like I once did with still good intent. So I think the more you can be really grounded in your own beliefs and your own values and what you want your um, classroom or your office or whatever you want your help to look like to others, um, it's just really important to stay to stay grounded in that. And um, we always say one student, one unsolved problem at a time and um, start with one and then you will grow from there because once you have one student with one unsolved problem that has become solved, other people, other educators, other more of their friends, right? They want in on that good stuff. So I think the more you can stay grounded in your own values and really um, do professional development for yourself so that when you do come across those really hard conversations that you can carry yourself through them um, a little bit easier, even though they're still hard every time. <laughs> um, and then just to wrap up, so we mentioned before that we have a paper that is being reviewed with Dr. Green. So that is on the Lives in the Balance website. Um, Beth or Guy, they're going to be dropping a link in chat. So if you want to stay connected with us, just fill out the Google link there. Um, and that or it will take you to a Google form. Um, and we'll be sending some updates um, throughout the summer just to stay in touch. And um, we have an email address here if you want to write that down or um, Guy was going to drop that in the chat as well. And if this is something that you are interested in further, um, Rachel and I have had the opportunity to start developing some consulting packages that will be available through Lives in the Balance too. So um, fill out the form if you wish to stay in touch or just email us directly with, our, with any questions or follow-up. And... Um, I think now we'll turn it back to Guy, who will probably turn it back to us. All right, fantastic. That was a, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to take your screen off here real quick uh, and just have the uh, the group of us. Um, and I do want to clarify something that a couple of people uh, said in the chat. And it's it's unfortunate that Collaborative Proactive Solutions shares an acronym with Child Protective Services because uh, CPS in this context is not Child Protective Services. Uh, it is the Collaborative Proactive Solutions model. Um, but I want to go ahead, if you don't mind, and kick off some of the questions that we might have. And before I do, I want to let anyone know that's watching this. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll try to get through those. But my first question for you uh, both is really about where this started for you. So so what I'm guessing, and I'm going to guess and then you can tell me the story, but what I'm guessing is at some point as individual educators, you were exposed to the collaborative proactive solutions model and, and that that sparked your interest in in, in applying it probably not only uh, in your work, but uh, somehow then you made that connection to take it a step further. So can you tell us a little bit about how you really kind of started with a model and, and you know, how you were able to grow it? Because, you know, I've always said that even one one educator who takes a model like the collaborative proactive solutions approach and puts it in a classroom makes a great change for you know the students in, in that class but to be able to scale it on the scale of a, a school uh, and even beyond that is really amazing so how did you get uh, started in all of this and how long have you been um, into the model um i will i kind of brought it kelly was kind of my <laughs> my co-pilot um at the time in fond du lac i was actually working um as a school psychologist in five buildings we were down um uh, we were having a school psychologist shortage. Um, uh, so we, I was in five buildings and I knew I had to do this work, but it was very hard to grow in a large system um, and, and, and trying to do it in multiple buildings where there were multiple lenses around um, challenging behavior. So I really focused um, my work uh, and teaming up with um, Kelly because I knew Kelly and I worked at an elementary building that was um, definitely having a lot of unsolved problems. Um, our kids had a lot of lagging skills. Um, it was known uh, for being a tougher building um, when it comes when it came to challenging behavior. So we really just kind of just started talking about um, uh, how we were going to grow this and what we couldn't fight. <laughs> like we couldn't fight the data, or we couldn't fight that you know PBIS or some of the things that uh, had existed in our system. So how could we 
now that we have changed our lens and this is how we think, how do we keep our clear boundaries around how we want help to look like for our kids? How do we align that um, into what we have with our current practices? Um, so that's kind of just kind of how it evolved. So it led to a lot of conversations um, that may have like started with frustration, but like we always talk about venting, but you want to vent to someone who's going to take you to a higher level. So we were kind of um, that for each other. Um, and then, you know, we were, we had a lot of rapport with, um, with uh, the staff um, in our district. So when we had the opportunities to have these conversations about how we could do better or how we could change um, our approach with kids, we just took every opportunity that we had. Um, administrator support is huge. Um, I have that completely now. Um, Kelly's had that. Now she's going to be an administrator herself, which is which is really exciting because she can bring that lens to a group of administrators in a very large school district, um, you know, to help grow this work as well. Um, but it was just a lot of conversations and and work. I think the other thing we always say is we our buildings were in a point of like so reactive that it was painful. And I think I was like my I think one of our low my lowest point was. I literally remember picking out my shoes for the day and I could not wear my shoes I wanted because I needed tennis shoes because I was like that reactive. Mm -hmm. And so we got to such a point where we were like, something has to change and we didn't know what, but it really had to. And so when we started, we read um, Lost at School or no. Lost and Found. Lost at School. Lost, Lost at School. Yeah. And then we read Lost and Found. We read them both multiple times. Um, but we we really started there. And what I was already doing was a student support meeting. So that changed to the LSA. That was the that was control that I had. Because I had to run some kind of meeting. But now this was my boundary with that. So I think, like, advice going forward, too. Like, think of the things that you are doing and how can you start to slowly and softly tweak that so it is aligning in a way that is super proactive and feels really good? Yeah, and you mentioned, by the way, the, the support from leadership. So I just wanted to share this comment here. Uh, so proud of Rachel and appreciate her leadership <laughs> at, at uh, F. Uh, FLC uh, from the principal there, uh, Carrie Joe Patton, and and certainly, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, having that support, you know, with the leadership is really really critical. Uh, change is hard. Changing culture is hard. Uh, changing practice is hard. Uh, so it's been great that you've been able to do that. And and, and Kelly, probably really exciting for you, uh, moving into a leadership position. Uh, really want to hear kind of what you face because certainly one of the things that we probably all know is that change is hard. And, you know, I'm kind of curious, I'll, I'll throw one more question, then I'll, I'll stop. So Beth, because I can tell she's ready. But, um, you know, when when you begin to bring new ideas and, and uh, bring about ideas like the collaborative proactive solutions approach, I'm sure you ran into uh, some resistance, some people that weren't ready to change their lens. Um, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you handled that in your journey, because that, that's a really a tough part. You know, people find a program like uh, the collaborative proactive solutions approach, and they're excited about it. But then as they begin to, to get you know, try to get people to buy in, sometimes that resistance happens. So what have you done to help your your uh, team kind of manage that issue? I think the biggest thing was that we really started slow and it wasn't like a brand new shiny initiative that we were launching ever. And to be honest, like we we still have staff that aren't fully familiar with the model and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but where you have your stakeholders and your like your SEL teams and your those positions and if you can agree at that team level, it doesn't have to be school wide yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's you know one thing that has been helpful. I was providing counseling to students all the time and still do was eh, right. Um, but that changed. I no longer was talking about listening skills. Right. I'm problem solving with skills related to difficulty, right? Going right off of there also. Um, so I think starting slow was really big, really leaning into your supports that you have. Like um, Rachel and I are no longer the same building, but we talk probably too much um, <laughs> because we're always running ideas off of each other. Um, I think the other thing that we always really think of too is 
teachers, adults, humans, we all do well if we can. So if there's a reason that a teacher is having difficulty coming to a plan B conversation, we're going to problem solve that too. And um, I think going back to like, um, again, Dr. Bruce Perry's work of what happened to you, like if there's a reason that an educator is having a hard time hearing the student's story, there's a reason there. So I think the more we can really bring that human side back into um, our schools, it's just so important. And, you know, you lead, you lead by example. And I think um, you also have to be firm in your boundaries and clear, but also that warm side of understanding that not everybody is on this journey with us. Um, but empathy lives in the hearts of all educators, especially. Mm -hmm. um, so just recognizing that it does take time, but you, you can get there. And that teachers want to help kids mm -hmm. achieve great test scores, yes, and how to be really great humans. And I think this is some of the framework that really helps um, bring, bring that back to education. OK, fantastic. Um, so I have to say that I I am so frustrated when when I your answer is absolutely makes perfect sense because if you try to implement something on the adults um, that's different from what they've done all along you're going to get the pushback and the resistance even uh, automatic not necessarily because they they want to um, but the idea of when it's so clear <laughs> how much better it is, I just, the slowness is hard for me. Um, but clearly that's the way to go about it. I, um, when I first started really learning about all the way things were done in schools, uh, Wisconsin was touted, it was promoted in the literature I was looking at, I think it was PBIS literature, as being a combined trauma-informed and PBIS, which I never could quite understand. Do you, were you guys around for that part when it was, I think your governor was the superintendent at yes. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was very much um, how you could integrate these two things together, but you guys have done it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so that leads me to my next question. Is the, is the Department of Education in Wisconsin recognizing your work? Um, we haven't gotten to that <laughs> level yet, although when we were in that um, a call uh, recently with, with you, Beth, someone had private chatted me that oh. they had shared some work, some of our um, work with the Department of Public Instruction. Um, it really kind of, uh, we really have been more local in what happened, and then we got connected to Dr. Green, and then COVID happened, uh, so we really haven't... Um, uh, gone statewide yet. Um, however, we do have some, um, we're presenting at the Wisconsin School Counselor Association um, this this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully there'll be some momentum too. And then just trying to balance our full-time gigs and then everything else going on. But our hope would be that there would be some recognition there. We'd be, figure out a way um, there's a lot of CPS work going on in Wisconsin. Dr. Green has been here multiple times. Uh, the trauma-informed model or um, what they're um, putting out to schools is really good. It's really positive. It's how I found um, Dr. Green um, in our work. Um, but um, hopefully we'll see some of that grow. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are, I mean, you're demonstrating how to make it how to make it accessible to people. Mm -hmm. And I'm so appreciative. Um, one of the things that I, I thought of, and there were several things I've heard you say today or other times about um, that seem to be just really good ways of getting this across to people without flagging the um, um, defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. And one thing you did was um, you, you said in, I think in October, at the mental health conference or one of those, that rather than when someone, you didn't correct people. When someone talked about this kid, did you see what Johnny did? He's just the most disorganized, inappropriate kid I've ever seen. And you would say, you would respond with, I wonder what unsolved problem he has, or I wonder what his lagging skill is. I, it just really struck me how you were able to integrate the language in 
And it sounded like people started paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you had just, you know, berated them for <laughs> their lack of sensitivity and knowledge, you wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wondered, I think I've heard you talk about um, functional behavior assessments. <clears throat> Those to me are challenging because the presumption is you're going to determine what the function of the behavior is. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't think we can go there. But so how, how do you manage that, that expectation of teachers and, and psychologists and counselors? How do you handle the requirements for a functional behavior assessment? Um, our FBAs, our functional behavioral assessments, are part of every emotional behavioral disability uh, evaluation that we um, do um, or have on a, on a student. Um, what um, There is a model or there's an example on the Lives in the Balance website, which is very similar to what my FBAs look like. Um, so I stated at, at a functional, at, when I'm going over the FBA, that um, the function of the behavior is to indicate that they're having these unsolved problems and lagging skills with the student. So an LSUP is included, the entire LSUP, what the lagging schools are, the lagging skills that were identified with that student, and the unsolved problems are part of that FBA. Um, and then we talk about how their unsolved problems are impacting them, like socially in the classroom, with their relationships with other adults. Um, so it's it's it looks very different. I don't do a motivation assessment. We don't do motivation assessments um, because, like we said, we don't believe that kids are motivated to do bad or to do good. Um, and then, um, so it's very CPS flavored. Um, and the way I found that where I really got my structure was from I think a school. I don't remember where their school was. Maybe Canada. I don't remember um, one of the districts that had given an example to lives in the balance. That's kind of a lot of what our FBAs look like. And that is such a better way to talk to a parent or with a parent about their student. Like I think we always have our parent lenses on too about if I'm going to receive difficult information about my, my child, um, that I, that is my entire world. How, is that going to come across and how do I want that um, how do I want that conversation to go and just changing that structure has been huge it those meanings just feel different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, I, I want to transition into a question kind of getting back to this back to this idea of kind of taking PBAS and taking collaborative proactive solutions and bringing those two things together um, you know for for a lot of folks and and, and self-included you know there's a lot of concern around um, the practices that are often part of um, a PBIS system. So what we've seen is the implementation in many cases are, are steeped in behaviorism uh, and, and really the approach that they're taking is, is kind of a, a very classical behaviorism approach. So it's, it's about, okay, well, we want to identify the ABCs. We want to, you know, what, what was the antecedent? You know, what is the behavior? What's the consequence? Um, and, you know, looking at kids as being, you know, manipulative, you know, maladaptive, you know, the, the whole, whole suite of things. Um, and, you know, there, there's this thought that, uh, you know, I remember having a conversation at one point with, with George Shigai, who was one of the people behind the PBAS framework. And, and one of the, the points that really stuck home to me is that at the end of the day, the, the idea is that it's a framework. Uh, I guess one of the challenges out there is that often what gets implemented inside of the framework are things that aren't working for the kids that need the help the most. And, and that's where the collaborative practice solutions model is really great because what we know is it's not, a, you, you said it, it's not just reward and consequence. Uh, and then that often tends to be the basis for a lot of programs that are that are steeped in PBIS. So, you know, the, the question I get, guess that I'm getting at is, um, you know, it, it's twofold in that PBIS sounds great, positive behaviors, you know, interventions and supports, it, it sounds really positive, but we know that some of the things that are part of the practice are often harmful to the kids that need the help the most, or even the things that are intended to be positive. You know, the kids that are having the behavior, uh, you know, um, challenges aren't the ones that are ever able to attend these special events and, and do things like that, or always are, are having uh, difficult times. So how did you, how and why, I guess is the question, um, you know, because I think that what you've done is a really great model to say, you know what, we can use the framework, 
but let's look at different ways that we can you know work with and support children within the framework so if the framework's already adopted and, and places are using it so how did you kind of come to that idea to uh you know rather than because you know there's there's some approaches to be like okay we need to get rid of this and that's not so easy and it's not so easy to get rid of something that's well entrenched and and has gotten a lot of support um, so how did you kind of arrive at this idea of bringing the two together and, and what kind of response have you, have you gotten to that? Well, we knew we had to bring it together because PBIS, um, wasn't going away. Um, it, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a huge, I don't remember if it was 23 or $25 million grant, multiple year grant through the department of, of education. So we knew that that was just something that we um, had to grapple with, but we also knew where some of our staff and some of our colleagues were getting stuck was how does this fit into PBIS because PBIS is rooted in behaviorist theory um, and that doesn't really align with um, the theory of kids do well um, if they can. Um, so that a lot of people were getting hung up on and we just had to figure out a way to move faster um, how we were just going to get over that, and we knew we couldn't say PB PBIS is out the door. We're done with PBIS. That wasn't going to happen. And I, I do think that PBIS is trying to evolve. Some of the things coming out from our state level are very trauma, you know, are centered around trauma informed care. Um, but it gets confusing, right? Because uh, and that's where I get confused. And when I talk to PBIS leaders in the state, um, it, you know. I, it is a little bit confusing about how we could still run under certain theories or be rooted in that, but then um, want to embrace these other approaches. And they mm -hmm. and they do embrace CPS and they do embrace common form practices, but they haven't really addressed, in my opinion, they haven't really addressed it um, as to how that can fit in. And, and so people get confused. And then you have really stressed out, in my opinion, stressed out administrators and educators. And when we're stressed, we want something super rigid and we want something super clear. And we want to do, we go back to what we've always done, even though it's not working. And that's what we, that's just what we retreat to because we're not regulated. Um, so that's what we were trying to fight. So we were like, you know, we just talked, like she's talked, we had the structure in place, we had some of the meetings in place, we had the data, let's change all of that to be reflective of where our hearts are, where our minds are, where our work is. Mm -hmm. um, I had mentioned the Dare to Lead um, work that we did as a, as in my building when I first got here. I was new, <laughs> well, after 17 years, I'm like, I'm gonna do this because we're gonna just work on culture right away which was really great and really um, uh, brave. brave. <laughs> I was uh, channeling my inner Brene, but it really did help us with um, the rumble language. We talked a lot about her rumble language. How do we have these, how do we have better communicate? How do we have better conversations human to human to do this work? And it, it really has been pivotal in her work with educators. Um, she's got her hands in a lot of pots, I'm sure, but that really provided a structure for when we had to use the rumble language and have difficult conversations as to challenging what people have always known. Um, so that was that was kind of huge to helping us kind of to grow this work and, and have even conversations with some of the PBIS folks that, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the grant money goes to people that are really overseeing PBIS. So there is some, pushback because I think people don't want their jobs to go away or that money to go away right, right. that's providing intervention for kids. And like I've always said, we've always said we need clear expectations for our kids. So what we do at tier one, it, uh, it is super helpful. Where it always got stuck for me personally in all my years of education was tiers two and tier three, what we're putting out um, to help at those levels are not super effective. So. Mm -hmm check in, check out for students isn't super effective. And I try, I always try to bring it back human to human. Uh, we use the word human a lot instead of adults versus kids. Um, you know, do I, if, we, if I was having difficulty at work, would I want to be carrying around a clipboard for every hour and getting right, feedback right. on something I was, no. And, and I, you know, some of our kids, my own children call them clipboard kids or, 
you know, there's a stigma there. And that's just one intervention that they offer, they offer many and some are effective and some aren't, but um, that's kind of where we've kind of gotten stuck. And, and, and so now, then your your hope is really to see an evolution of things like PBIS to include better practices, to include mm -hmm. trauma-informed approaches and mm -hmm. things like collaborative and proactive solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing, you know, as in education, there's a lot of buzzwords, right? So I think like a buzzword right now is student voice. Mm -hmm. Yes, but student voice through a plan B conversation looks different than if we're calling it student voice at the table when we've already decided what's getting in their way and prescribing them an intervention or an outcome. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention too is that there are still times where we have we have to respond in a way to challenging behavior that also is in alliance with the code of conduct, right? Or like there are certain things where the line is very clear. However, the way in which a student leaves and returns to school feels so much better because they we know that they already have an ELSA or they are already familiar with problem solving at the table. They are already used to sharing their concerns. They know that this spot at the table is saved for them when they come back. So just to, you know, there are times where um, as educators, things happen and we still have such a, um, a lens on the way in which student leaves and comes is so important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, one of the things there, a couple things that strike me about PBIS, which is so completely counter to CPS and trauma-informed care, is is the lack of room. There's no space in there for uh, recognizing that not all behaviors are volitional. And so kids get treated based on what they did without recognizing what happened that it may not have been volitional or even and what what i i saw pretty recently in virginia was um a student who was exhausted a six-year-old and the the teachers were trying to combine pbis and breathing and take a walk together but they were reminding him you're going to get a you're going to get it you're making a red choice i'm marking it on your board that's going up here remember if you want to get your this and and never um, connecting that this is not a volitional thing and in fact escalating the kid to the point that he, he was completely out of control and and you've said a lot about how um, the regu the adults uh, the regulation for the adults which um, I know for myself it's critical um, <laughs> And I, I think that's part of what is is a challenge when when you try to integrate the things. But you guys are just modeling how to make it happen, and I'm so grateful that you are because you're making things, you're changing significant things that will, I expect, have a ripple effect. Um, and let me give you one example that I I don't know what you're doing now, but I wonder about it. And that's in the tier one. Those what are our principles? responsible, safe, and what the other one was. It, <clears throat> those things strike me as um, being behind those, there's a supposition about the child's behavior that's gonna demonstrate those. And we come back to when a child is not acting responsibly or whatever the other one was, the safe one has a double whammy to me because we want the kids to feel safe in their self it's a whole different definition of what is meant usually by when people say safe productive respectful whatever it was so I, i'm curious about whether you have designs on that <laughs> I think, um beth as you were speaking to um you know like we said before going really slow and really bringing the human side back into our schools has been so important to us. And, um, you know, the more you start, once you see it, like we said before, you can't unsee it. And I think starting, starting there is so important and realizing like kids do well if they can, adults do well if they can, we all are. And the only thing, like we always say to students, like, the worst thing that's going to happen here is that 
this you you still have difficulty meeting this expectation and here's what's going to happen you're going to come back to this table mrs blachek is going to be here with us because she's your classroom teacher and we're going to work through it together and i think the more that you can model that like okay we do have this even in your mind you're like oh my gosh but wait what are we going to do and how you're like no the student is the expert right they know what's getting in their way and the more we can just bring that to to the masses right is our is our goal that's so great. I have an idea. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Speaking of modeling, it would be great if you guys did some videos <laughs> of what it looks like. <laughs> so um, I just want to remind folks, we're actually just about coming up on time here. We've got a couple mm -hmm. more minutes. Uh, but if anybody in the audience has any questions or comments, uh, feel free to put those into the chat now. Um, you know, I uh, did get a comment a second ago, the loving, not all behaviors being volitional. But I do, I'll ask you a question while we see if anybody has any final questions. Um, and, and this maybe gets to what Beth was saying as well. What you've done is amazing. Um, and, and what I love about what you've done is is the, the two of you coming together, and apparently a raccoon, because I saw a raccoon on the skateboard there. I don't know what that was about. But <laughs> the, the two of you coming together to, to take this idea be beyond just a single, you know, a single classroom and, and to bring it into a school and to, to think about how it fit into existing models like PBIS is really amazing. You know, I guess the, the question I have for you is, are you working with any others in other schools or other states uh, to try to bring this model or to try to use this model in, in their schools? So, you know, this would be great to see in, in other states where people might be trying to emulate what you're doing in terms of, uh, you know, taking um, the collaborative proactive solutions approach and bringing it into their, their PBS approach. Have you uh, seen any progress on that? Yeah, I mean, we are, um, you know, we're working with Lives in the Balance Suite. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we're just um, starting some of our consultation. So, um, you know, Lives in the Balance had, had um, uh, they had packages to get really good at CPS and they have mm -hmm. people that have been trained in CPS and that is absolutely something that you should, if you're in a large district, you definitely want to make sure you know that you're doing CPS and they have people there to help with that. Um, we're um, working with um, Dr. Green and Lives in the Balance on creating consulting packages for districts um, or schools. Um, we have a couple of, of things booked right now um, to work with schools on how to um, how to do the work that we have done on a personal basis. So working with them on what their staff development will look like, um, because like I mentioned, we incorporate a lot of Brene Brown, Bruce mm -hmm. Perry, Mona Della Hook, you know, a lot of, of that work is incorporated into our work because we try not to just look at CPS within PPIS, but how do we do a lot of talk about connection. So adult to adult and adult to child. Um, so we are working with Lives in the Balance and that's one way um, you can connect with us and that Google form if you're looking for some assistance, um, you know, from us to help you, um, you know, Great. on your journey. Yeah, and I put that in the chat as well. And I will announce that if you haven't seen it yet, Lives in the Balance has a brand new website. Yes. Uh, they, they just redid it and launched it, I think, yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of great information there to learn about the collaborative proactive solutions uh, mm -hmm. model. And, and I love that you talk about bringing in other work because I think that's you know very much where where we are um, kind of organizationally is with you know we we've you know worked with Dr. Green and Mona Della Hook and Lori Desatels mm -hmm. and you know so many people doing amazing work and it all really does fit together. Uh, when I read Mona's book, I thought, well, gee, if, if Ross tells you what to do, Mona tells you why. Um, and, and as you begin to kind of fit those things together, uh, it's really helpful in developing that that approach. So um, great yeah, to we hear. Talked, we were joking the other day. I talked, I'm like, wouldn't it be awesome to just like have a stage where we all like travel and like everybody gets to, <laughs> to be on stage with each other and kind of a who's who. But because I mean, I think we're all doing really good work and stuff, absolutely you know, and wanting yeah. to connect that. Yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate tomorrow I get to join actually an event with Mona Delahook. Uh, she's going to be teaching a master class in Beyond Behaviors uh, for a um, video that she's recording. And I'm going to get to join that live. So I'm really excited to be able to to spend a day with We've actually not met. We've talked a lot, but uh, uh, that's going to be really great. So a lot of, lot of amazing people out there doing really great work and, and trying to shift, you know, trying to shift things away from the approaches that really aren't working. Mm -hmm. So your work is really inspirational. Um, so I think we're we're heading up on time here. Um, 
Oh, okay. There is a question here. Um, let's let's take a look here. Uh, since many students facing challenges are neurodivergent or disabled, uh, which neurodivergent and disabled all apps do you follow? Uh, do you have any recommendations for that? Beth, I know you've got a handful probably. Um, well, Dr. Ross Green for one. <laughs> um, we so I think our some of our top favorites that we've really found to be most helpful for sure. Um, Brene Brown, Dr. Bruce Perry, um, Mona Delahook, really. Um, who else? Um, Dominique Smith has a really great book. Um, All Learning is Social and Emotional. Um, I'm really blanking off the top of my head, but I think as much, um, like we listen to a lot of podcasts, especially, um, on the way to school in the morning, not so much on the way home because by that point I'm pretty much fried. Um, but I think the more you can just listen and gather some language that you can then find what feels right and really use that, um, in your conversations, like one of the things we talk a lot about is humans, like eliminating that power differential because we all like to feel um, similar because we are human. So I think using just the more you can familiar, get familiar with right, language right, feels right. good. Yeah, and, and Mel, I think to, to your point uh, also, you know, it's uh, Neuroclastic or uh, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. A lot of organizations that are that are also uh, writing great articles and doing pieces of research. Because I think you were really kind of into that, um, you know, people that are actually neurodivergent and disabled. Mm. Um, we actually at the Alliance have a, a couple of autistic uh, self-advocates that are part of our, our team and, and many that are part of the community. But, you know, that's that's a great point and kind of thinking about, um, you know, representation uh, there mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, Beth, I know you always have the final question. We are just about at <laughs> that time. Uh, uh, no, it's going well, to be a one-parter, not a 12-parter. <laughs> well, actually, it's not even a question. It is. Okay. Um, it is. I want to just tell you how grateful I am to you for the work you're doing. And I see you doing two things. You're, I can't think of the right word. It's like explorers. You're, you're, you're sh going into new frontiers. And you are telling, you're showing us how to do it. And you are also, so you're, you're modeling and you're showing it can be done, and you're developing all of this great, um, useful ways to make it done, the way you use the OSIP for a meeting, the way you've reframed uh, functional behavior analysis. I'm so grateful for what you're doing, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up. You know, I said an hour and 15 minutes. We're a little bit long here, but I appreciate you uh, you uh, hanging on a little bit longer with us. Uh, this has been really, really helpful. And, and our hope with all of these kinds of uh, presentations that we do are that they will be shared. You know, that uh, if you're in the audience and you're watching this and, and you're a parent, share it with teachers or staff at your schools. Uh, if you're a teacher, share it with your administrators. You know, trying to get uh, more people kind of aware of more ways to to better support kids uh, to move away from kind of compliance based approaches into you know connection and compassion and and all of that is really really important so uh thank you so much for joining us today and uh we will let you go but i just i'm going to make a couple of announcements here but kelly and rachel thank you so much thank you thank you all right thanks and beth thank you for co-hosting sure. and with that uh, i'm going to just make a couple last announcements um and uh i i did when i see mel had another comment there uh, and mel i'm a big fan also of the therapist neurodiversity collective a lot of great work there uh, and we've actually uh, worked to promote some of their information as well so lo lots of great information out there uh, i do want to talk about our next uh, presentation so as you are aware every two weeks we are doing a live event and our next one is coming up. We're, we're on an odd day today. We're not usually on uh, uh, Wednesday, but I had an event that I need or am attending tomorrow. So we will be back to our normal every other Thursday uh, schedule. And our next event, we have uh, Robin Peters Bennett coming to talk to us and talking about uh, helping dysregulated kids, a neurodevelopment developmentally informed approach to working with traumatized children. Uh, we know that that trauma plays a huge part uh, in, um, you know, the, the kids that, that we see that are being restrained, secluded, suspended, expelled, uh, even subjected to corporal punishment. Uh, you know, kids with disabilities, we see black and brown children are more often, uh, you know, impacted by these interventions. But as well, you know, kids that come from a trauma history, far more likely to be restrained and secluded. So we've got more great content coming up. Uh, as always, I want to thank everybody for joining us and hope to see you again soon. So thank you so much.